So open your Bibles to James 4. I hope you're having a good weekend. I'm still recovering from my stupidity. As you can see, I got my pad over there I'm sitting on. Uh, if you weren't here last week, uh, when we were out on the coast, I was in a skateboard accident. I was thinking that I was going to teach my kids how to ride a longboard down the hill, uh, except I didn't compensate and plan for stopping. So uh, if you missed that, that's why I got the bandage. And then also, I was jumping off a sand dune. I thought I was going to be Superman jumping off a sand dune and landed on some hard sand on my backside. So a uh, little bruised up, but uh, I'm, I'm healing up okay. So. Well, what a blessing to be in God's Word together. Amen? Amen. It's always a blessing to open God's Word together. And uh, we're coming to the end of our study of the book of James. We're at the very end of chapter 4, and Pastor Matt's going to kick off chapter 5 next week. Have you been enjoying James? Yeah, I have. Boy, I'll tell you what, it's been challenging, hasn't it? It's been really good. And this morning, uh, we're going to talk about what should be our attitude towards the future. That's the next topic that James takes up in James 4. You may have heard this fact, but young people around the world are becoming more and more pessimistic about the future. Have you heard that? Yeah. Actually, there was a recent survey done, and you're not going to be able to read that. I noticed that's pretty small. But a recent survey was done asking people under 30 if they thought that their lives would be as good as their parents. And not surprisingly, many came back saying no, especially in Western countries, which is kind of interesting. Uh, in countries in the Far East, in South America, in Asia, there was much more optimism about the future. But Western countries, as you can see right at the bottom, uh, Belgium was, was the most pessimistic at 12%. Uh, France, Spain, Italy, Great Britain, Great Britain, Canada, and then the U.S. The U.S. was at the bottom at 26%. Well, I didn't do a lot of reading into why these young people were more pessimistic. But you know what I've noticed? As those countries on the bottom have become more godless and the rise of people of unbelief, I'm not really surprised. I'm not really surprised that there's more pessimism with the younger generations coming up. Well, how we view the future, what, what we believe about the future is going to affect how we live today, right? It, it's connected. And so the question that, that James wants us to take up is, how should believers posture themselves towards the future? How should we view the future? And that's what we're going to look at today. I'm going to have you stand up, and we're going to go ahead and read and see what Pastor James is going to say to us. James 4, 13 through 17. He says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will travel to such and such a city and spend a year there and do business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What your life will be. For you are like vapor that appears for a little while, then vanishes. Instead, you should say, If the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So it is sin to know the good and yet not do it. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Would you pray with me? Lord, I just pray this morning as we get into this passage that you would speak to us, whether we're here today or whether we're watching online. God, I, I pray that you would open our eyes and our ears to, to hear your word 
You know where we need to be challenged by you. So God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 So again, this question that we're going to be talking about is what should we know about our plans for the future? And the first thing, it's on your outline in your bulletin if you want to follow along, is the foolish are arrogant about their futures even though they have limited control. Being arrogant about our futures is silly, right? Because we don't have ultimate control. And that's what James says in verse 13. He, he says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will travel to such and such a city and spend a year there and do business and make profit. The Baptist theologian Donald Burdick says the words come now, or maybe in your Bible it says now listen, in the NIV, is a pointed call for attention that indicates the seriousness of what follows. Pastor James is saying, believers, listen up. I have something very important to say to you. And this rebuke seems to be addressed primarily to businessmen or businesswomen in the church. And we know in the, in the Jewish community there were a lot of traders, a lot of business people. But this principle, these principles apply to all of us of what God's going to say. He says, come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will travel to such and such a city and spend a year there and do business and make profit. Now James says, come now you who say. So apparently it wasn't just a one-time occurrence. Apparently there were people within this church or churches that were arrogantly predicting their future. And so this is something that James felt like he needed to, to address in these churches. He needed to bring this up. And you can notice the detailed plans that these businessmen have about where and how long and how fruitful their plans are going to be. But the only thing missing is God. We don't see God in these plans, right? They were making these plans arrogantly about their future, and yet they were not including God in the details. About a year and a half ago, we went through the book of Daniel, and we looked at the person of Nebuchadnezzar, and God did some great things through Nebuchadnezzar, um, but Nebuchadnezzar was also foolish. And it kind of reminded me of King Nebuchadnezzar when in all of his height and glory, he stood and he boasted about all he had accomplished. But he never mentioned God. And God was the one who, who allowed him to get to that position. Look at what it says in Daniel 4, 30-32. And these are the words of Nebuchadnezzar. Is this not Babylon the great that I have built to be a royal residence by my vast power and for my majestic glory? Boy, that's some arrogance, right? While the words were still in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared that the kingdom has departed from you. You will be driven away to live with the wild animals. In a flash of a moment, King Nebuchadnezzar, he was, he was living in his palace, right? With all the comforts and the pleasures. And in a flash of a moment, he was humbled. And he was grazing with the animals. And the crazy thing about Nebuchadnezzar, right, if you remember the story, is that he was warned in a dream. God had warned him and brought the, the prophet Daniel 
into his life to tell him to humble himself. But he still did not humble himself. And in the letter of James, we see many times that James is telling his listeners to humble yourselves. Humble yourselves before the Lord. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will lift you up. Well, why is that? Well, look at verse 14. James says, Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What your life will be. How can you boast about next year, about where you're going to go and what you're going to do when you don't even know what tomorrow is going to bring? You may step off the sidewalk tomorrow and get hit by a car. You don't know what tomorrow is going to bring, what your life will be. You know, as I was thinking about that verse, I was thinking about two very powerful, talented individuals that, that I saw rise to glory when I was in my youth. Uh, the first was an athlete by the name of Bo Jackson. How do you remember Bo Jackson? <laughs> yeah. Bo Jackson, Auburn University. At one time, Bo Jackson was probably the greatest athlete on this planet. Bo Jackson accomplished something that no other athlete before him had ever accomplished. Bo Jackson was an all-star in Major League Baseball and also an all-star in, in the National Football League. I mean, can you believe that? How talented this guy was. I mean, there was talk about him being a Hall of Famer in both baseball and football. There were advertising campaigns about him. Nike had a, a campaign called Bo Knows. And they had Bo skating in ice skates with a hockey stick and playing tennis and, and, and other things. And basically the point was, anything Bo sets his mind to, he can do. Well, in a playoff game in 1990, he was playing for the Raiders. And he was in a play where he was hit by a defensive player and he dislocated his hip. At first, it seemed like it was just a routine tackle and, and an injury. But when the medical professionals did the x-rays, what they found is that he had a degenerative hip condition that caused the dislocation. And you know, sadly, after that day, Bo Jackson never stepped on the football field again after that injury. And his baseball career came to an end too. He played a couple more years in, in, in MLB, but he was never the same. He never stole another base again. James says, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring, what your life will be. Another guy who was up and coming and, and everybody was talking about him. He was, a, he was a lawyer. He was a journalist. A businessman was John F. Kennedy Jr., right? I mean, up and coming. He started a magazine by the name of George that became an instant success, a political magazine. He was married to a, a New York socialite, Carolyn Bassett. I mean, there seemed like there was no limit to what John F. Kennedy Jr. would accomplish. Being the only son of JFK, many were talking about him running for president someday. But sadly, at the age of 38, he was piloting a plane to Martha's Vineyard, and he and his wife and his sister-in-law were killed in that plane crash. Here one moment, gone the next. James says, you do not know what tomorrow will bring, what your life will be. Now I'm not saying that Bo Jackson or, or John F. Kennedy Jr. boasted about their future. Maybe they did. I don't know. I never knew them. I don't know. But boy, I'll tell you what, everybody was talking about what these guys were going to accomplish. What they were going to do. 
And that's the point James is making. As humans, we think that we have control of our lives, but ultimately we don't. We don't ultimately have control of our lives. He goes on to say in, in 16a, he says, You do not know what tomorrow will bring, what your life will be. He says, For you are like vapor that appears for a little while, then vanishes. Vapor is, is like a mist, right? As I was thinking about that, I was thinking about growing up in the Sacramento Valley. And uh, there, there were times in the summer that my brother and I would get up early and go play golf with my dad. And in the, in the Sacramento Valley, there was fog. There was mist. And so often we'd show up to the golf course and there'd be fog. It'd be all fogged in. And we'd complain about it. We'd get upset. And my dad would say, just deal with it. And I remember many times we would tee off on that first hole and we wouldn't even see where our ball went. We'd get down there and try to find it. But you know what? Being in Sacramento in the summer, it gets hot. And by lunchtime, that fog was gone. It was burned off. Friends, that is what James is saying about our lives. You see that? He's saying we're mist. He's saying we're vapor. We're here one moment and then we vanish. We're gone. I'm sure John F. Kennedy Jr. had thoughts about having children and, and grandchildren. He maybe even had thoughts about going into politics like his father. But that's not how it turned out for him, was it? Here one moment, gone the next. Friends, I, I really want us this morning to hear James' instruction, what he's saying to us. James is saying, he's saying, believers, don't make your plans without God. Amen. Don't arrogantly say, this is what I'm going to do, and not include God. Because if you do that, friends, you will be in for a rude awakening. But there is a wise way that we can view the future. And that's the second thing this morning. That's our second point. The wise hold the future loosely, allowing God's will to be done. See, the wise realize that our futures are in God's hands. And wise people learn to leave them there. To let God have control. James says in verse 15, he says, Instead, you should say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. Don't arrogantly tell God what you're going to do with your future, friends. Say, if the Lord wills, we will do this or do that. See, the wise understand that nothing happens in this life without the permissive will of God. Friends, we see that throughout the whole, the whole Scripture, the whole council of Scripture. Nothing happens on this planet without God's permission. And I'm not just talking about the good things, but also the bad things that happen. Satan understands that. That's why if you look at the book of Job, Satan had to go to God and ask for God's permission to test Job. With suffering, right? Because Satan realized that ultimately God is in control of everything. Now, that brings up the, the question of God's goodness and why God allows things to happen. And, and friends, that's a topic for another sermon. If you want to talk about it, give me a call. We'll have coffee this week. But here's the point that James is making. 
One thing is clear. Nothing happens without God's permission. Right? Nothing happens on this planet without God's permission. The wisest man who ever lived understood that. Solomon says, The mind of a person plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. See, Solomon understood that he understood the sovereignty of God, right? That God was ultimately in control. And in our minds, we can thoroughly plan our course, right? We can say, hey, this is my plan for the future. This is what I'm going to do. This is what it's going to look like. But hear me. Ultimately, it's God who directs our steps. Our lives are in God's hands. And I've seen that personally. In 1997, uh, I moved to Seattle to go to seminary. And in Seattle, I was working on a master's degree in counseling at Western Seminary. And you know, after about six months, I got so tired of the rain that I called my mom. I said, Mom, I can't handle this rain anymore. I'm thinking about transferring back to Sacramento State to finish my master's degree. And my mom encouraged me to hang in there. I said, okay, mom, I'll hang in there. I'll, I'll try to finish my degree, my two-year program, and then I'm out of here. Well, six years later, I was still in Seattle. I was married to Vanessa with two kids. And I wasn't working as a counselor. I was working as a pastor. God had different plans. And 22 years later, I'm still here. <laughs> I'm still in the Northwest. All the well-laid plans of mice and men, says the poet Robert Burns, right? But as you can see, I'm glad that my plans didn't come to fruition. Because God in His sovereign wisdom knew what was best. Right? God always knows what's best. The Apostle Paul understood that. In, in Ephesians 3.20, we see that in his prayer for the Ephesians. He says, Now to Him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think. Another version says, All that we ask or imagine according to the power that works in us. Friends, God can do even more than we ask or imagine. And I've always loved the words of 1 Corinthians 1.9 that says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love Him. God loves His people. And in His sovereign wisdom, He wills great things for us. That's why when we think that we know better than God, it offends Him, right? And that, that's, why, that's why God is so offended with rebellion. Because God in His love has great plans for us. God in His wisdom knows what's best for us. He created us. And yet in our rebellion, when we turn our back on God and say, God, I'm going to be in control. It breaks God's heart. It's offensive. You know, many times God says, okay. Let's see how that works for you. Friends, God loves us. He has great plans for us. In Isaiah 45, God says to the clay, He says, the clay can't say to the potter, what are you making? I know better than you. I mean, could you imagine the audacity if clay could talk? <laughs> I guess, right? If clay could talk. 
If clay would say to the potter, hey, what are you making? Don't make me into that. I know better than you. And God's saying, no. God says, I am the potter. You are the clay. Let me mold you into what I want you to be because I have great plans for you. Because I love you. That's why James says in verse 16, he says, but as it is, you boast in your arrogance and all such boasting is evil. James says, guys, you're not including God in your plans and you're boasting about what you're going to do. And by saying this, by doing this, you're saying that you know better than God and you're in control when ultimately you're not. How many of you have done skydiving before? Is there anybody here that crazy? I just need to know. Okay? That's one of the things that I told Anna. I guess it's on my bucket list. Someday we're going to go skydiving together. We'll see. But when you go skydiving, the first thing you do is you do tandem skydiving, right? You, you have a, an expert skydiver who is strapped to you on your back. Thank goodness. But could you imagine if that novice got to the ground and, and that novice started bragging to his friends that he was an expert skydiver? He would be wrong. The expert skydiver is the guy strapped to his back. The novice wasn't really in control. It was the other guy. Who opened the chute? Who opened the chute at the right time? Friends, hear me on this. When we boast in our arrogance about our lives and, and, and we boast believing that we're in control of our lives, we're, we're like the novice skydiver, aren't we? I mean, we think we're in control, but in, in reality, we're not. Ultimately, God's in control of our lives. And James closes with this statement. He says, so it is sin to know the good and yet not do it. Now, there are some commentators that believe that that phrase stands on its own that it's not connected to the previous section of, of what we were just talking about. It, it's essentially saying, hey, if, if, if you know good and you don't do it, then it's a sin. Now, that is true to some degree. But if that's the case, then I'm a pretty big sinner. And so are you. Because I go to bed every night knowing that there are neighbors who have houses all around mine that I have not shared the gospel with. There are homeless people in, in the city of Eugene that, that I have not fed. There are people in jail today that would love to have somebody come visit them and I have not visited them. So I don't think that's what James is saying. I think that that phrase is connected to what we've been talking about. Here's what I think James is saying. James is saying that we need to live our lives with a posture that says, not my will be done, but thy will be done. That that's, that's how we're to live as believers. Lord, if it wills, if it's your will, Lord then I'll go there. If it's your will, Lord, then I'll do that. And that's our key point this morning. That's, that's what I really want us to take home today. The foolish person boasts about their future, thinking that they're in control. 
But a wise person plans for the future with humility and flexibility. That, that needs to be how we view the future. That needs to be our attitude. We need to have an attitude of humility and flexibility. Friends, I, I really want us to hear this today. I, I, I do. I, I, want to, I want us to allow James and the Holy Spirit to instruct us. I want all of us to, to be in a place where we're allowing God's will to be done with, with where we live, with, with where we work, with our kids, the plans for our kids, etc. Right? Because if, boy, I'll tell you what, if, if we get in that place of arrogance and pride, we may be in for a rude awakening. Because God has the authority and the wisdom and the power to redirect us at any point. Any point along the way. So here, here's how we should pray to the Lord. Lord, this is the desire of my heart. This is what I want for my life, for my wife, for my kids, etc. Right? You fill in the blank. But Lord, if, if this is not what is best, if, if this is not going to bring you the most glory, then Lord, you have the freedom to redirect. You have the freedom to guide and direct me wherever I need to go. Friends, I believe that's the place of wisdom for a believer. Well, in closing this morning, before we close uh, with a couple songs, uh, I, I want to give you just a few moments, whether you're here or watching online, just to talk to the Lord. And maybe you've never prayed to the Lord in that way. Maybe you need to try that on today. And may, maybe it's for the very first time. Maybe you've never allowed the Lord to take control of your life before. And this is the very first time. And you're inviting the Lord to come into your life. To be your master. Or maybe, like most of us here today, I know we're believers. But sometimes our pride gets in the way, doesn't it? Sometimes it's, it's not thy will be done, it's my will be done. So I want to give you just a few moments of quiet prayer right now, just to, just to talk to the Lord before I close this, and just to try that prayer on of, of praying and, and allowing God to have His will be done in your life. Let's pray.